Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We're just going to take a few more minutes to get connected with our panelists who will be joining virtually. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I hope you're all having a wonderful day so far, and thank you to MNC for hosting this event, this summit, this very important event. <clears throat> My name is Caitlin Rathwell, and I'll have the pleasure of moderating this panel session. We, we will be joined by a series of experts in the field of youth child and family services, and they're going to connect us to their expertise on the sustainable development goals. So Dr. Gwen Phillips from the BC First National Data Governance Initiative, Dr. Tahu Kakutai from University of Waikato, New Zealand, Dr. Allison Stevenson from the University of Saskatchewan, thank you. And Marcel St. Ange, who's from the Metis National Council and joining us here in person. So this panel brings together a diverse array of voices to explore the relationship between indigenous child, youth, and family services and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Through an exchange of insights, experiences, and innovative strategies, this panel emphasizes the role of self-determination, partnerships, data, and Métis culture as they play a role in creating a better future for children, youth, families, and communities. So to start, I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your passion in this area, and perhaps take around two minutes if possible to do that. 
So I'll pass it to you first, Gwen Phillips, please. Thank you. And hopefully you can hear me okay. Are you able to hear me okay? All right, thank you. Thank you very much for the opening. Thank you for convening and for inviting me into your space. I'm Gwen Phillips from the Tunaka Nation, and I'm, disclaimer, not a PhD. I'm a grandmother. Um, that's probably the title I admire the most uh, that I, I carry. Um, I've worked for my nation for over 40 years now, and in that tenure, I've done some amazing things with the people supporting me, uh, help of the people supporting me. We negotiated the first local education agreements in BC, thus breaking the federal provincial master tuition agreement where they used to pay for our kids in school, regardless of whether or not they were educated. We established my nation under my tutelage, the first community-based healing and intervention program to address fetal alcohol exposure, and that was in the early 1990s. And we did so through a community development and population health approach. I also develop and instruct various uh, um, courses, including First Nation Studies with the College of the Rockies, a few other institutions. And one of the other highlights is negotiating an MOU with Métis Nation BC years ago so that their people uh, can be served across my territory through the various structures that we uh, have put in place. My nation provides services on and off reserve for uh, all you know, Aboriginal people, regardless of whether they're status or non-status Indians, Métis, Inuit people, Indigenous peoples, uh, now I guess we're called. Um, and so, yeah, so we've done that uh, work for a long, long time. And also um, in my, my uh, probably the past 15 years or so, a lot of time was spent um, supporting the work to transfer the First Nations Inuit Health Branch uh, to uh, what's now called the First Nations Health Authority. Um, and I was part of the First Nations Health Council, which is the governance arm of that work for over a, a decade. Um, so uh, again, uh, one of the most important titles I think it carry is a grandmother, and I uh, hang that up with the uh, work I've done with the BC Office of the Human Rights Commissioner uh, and uh, publishing their report they published uh, called the Grandmother Perspective on Disaggregated Data. So bringing grandmother conversations into the world of data. Thank you. Oh, beautiful, I love that. <clears throat> grandmother lens. And I'll pass it to you, Dr. Allison Stevenson. Thank you, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so. Um, I'm a Métis scholar and adoptee whose family is from Canistano, Saskatchewan. I was adopted at birth and raised in Regina. I joined the Indigenous Studies Department at the University of Saskatchewan as the Gabriel Dumont Research Chair in Métis Studies in July 2020. Um, I obtained my PhD in History from the University of Saskatchewan in 2015. Uh, from 2016 to 2017, I was the first Aboriginal postdoctoral fellow at the University of Guelph, where I worked on developing an historical analysis of Indigenous women's political organizing in Saskatchewan in the 1970s, resisting um, a lot of the policies, the child removal policies that um, impacted so many First Nations and Métis children during that period. Uh, my current research um, specializes in histories of Indigenous women's political organizing, the 60s scoop, Métis history, and resistance to settler colonialism by our people. My book, Intimate Integration, The 60s Scoop and the Colonization of Indigenous Kinship, won several awards um, and was published with the University of Toronto Press in December of 2020. I've also published um, academic articles on family caring, um, Métis family caring and Yvonne Boyer and Larry Chartrand's edited collection, Métis Rising, um, looking looking at Saskatchewan um, Métis Society at the time's resistance to the removal of children and proposal of a series of um, Métis specific um, family and child caring strategies, um, as well as other articles on Indigenous women's organizations and Métis histories in Saskatchewan. I am also a mother to four amazing children. Actually, technically they're all adults now since my youngest two turned 18 in December. So. It's a little bit hard to believe, not a grandmother though, so uh, not, not quite ready for that. Um, and we live in our family, my Métis family's ancestral homeland uh, of Flat Springs, Saskatchewan, near the forks of the Saskatchewan River. Um, during my time as a PhD student and, and since, since then, I've worked closely with First Nations and Métis elders 
um, who have really taught me a lot about the impact of the 60 scoop in residential schools on families and children, um, the inter intergenerational impacts, working with Mel uh, in partnership with the Métis Nation Saskatchewan and Marguerite Riel Centre. Um, and these elders really um, held knowledge and experiential knowledge as well and provided important insights for me in my, in my understanding of Indigenous kinship, experiences of residential schooling in the 60s scoop. And so um, at this time uh, in my research, I still, I do continue to work on the 60s scoop and provide, um, you know, educational um, talks and um, to various community organizations, whether it's um, Métis locals or the Saskatchewan Health Authority, wherever um, the knowledge, um, wherever people demonstrate an interest in learning more about the 60s scoop, I do certainly, um, you know, find that's important to, to educate, educate people about its impacts. Um, but I currently work also with Cumberland House, Saskatchewan, um, the community of Cumberland House, and the Weldon and Canistino Métis local in Saskatchewan on community-driven historical research projects on kinship land and water. So I'm very honoured to have been invited to share my perspective um, as part of this panel. Merci. Thank you so much, Alison. <clears throat> Your book sounds so interesting. I'll be heading to the bookstore right after this panel. <laughs> Passing it along to Dr. Tahu Kakutai. Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, ki ngā kaiārahi o tēnei hui, ki a koutou uku hoa kai kōrero, ko koe Glenn, Alison, Marcel, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou. So greetings to you all. Thank you, Kate, for sending the thousands of emails to ensure that I turned up at the right time. I'm beaming in from National Geographic. Society headquarters. We're talking about indigenous data. Uh, we're talking about colonial legacies of science and exploration, <laughs> the erasure of indigenous knowledges, and how we can and how they can do better moving forward. So this is a really it's a hot topic, um, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. Always to sit alongside you, Gwen. Uh, you uh, such a form formidable um, a front runner. That's a terrible. That's a terrible term. Auntie, grandmother, wahine toa, woman of courage, warrior woman <laughs> in this space and always been super inspired by your work. Nice to meet you too, Alison and uh, Marcel, who I gather is on stage. So um, so my name is Tahu Kukutai. Uh, I hail from the tribes of Ngāti Mahanga, Ngāti Tipa, Ngāti Kinohaku and Te Opori. So that's in the central North Island and um, in the far north. I live in a little town called Ngārua Wahia. Um, beside our uh, ancestral river, which is the longest river in Aotearoa, um, 270 miles. I think it's long. It might not be that long compared to Canada. <laughs> um, and I live in a, a, this little town of about 7,000 people, and half of them are Māori. Um, it's the heartland of the Māori king movement, uh, what we call the Kingitanga, uh, which was established in 1858 to unify our tribes to stop our land from being taken uh, from us by the colonial government and settlers um, with varied success. Um, and my great grandparents moved from their tribal territories uh, to support the King movement, and we've been there ever since. And uh, my children are the fifth generation uh, of living in this town um, next to our, our marae, Tūranga Waiwai. Um, so that's who I am. Um, I guess in terms of my professional background, I'm a social scientist uh, located in a population research centre at the University of Waikato. Um, my sort of research has two main areas. One is in uh, Indigenous and Māori demography, so it's critical population research. Uh, much of that is kind of subverting demography from the desktop to make the numbers useful uh, to our tribes and to our communities. Uh, so that's very fulfilling work. Uh, and I work with incredible people at that centre. And the other area, and, and you know, I'm a latecomer to this. Gwen's been in, in this area of data sovereignty for a very long time. For us, it's been maybe about 10 years. I'm a, a founding member of Te Mana Raraunga, which is the Māori Data Sovereignty Network established in 2015. 
um, and also a founding member of GIDA, which is the Global uh, Indigenous Data Alliance, um, which has been around for about the same period of time, maybe a bit shorter. And then for the past five years, I've been a, a technician for the National Tribal Leaders Forum Data Group, uh, which has the mandate to progress the uh, data aspirations of the 80 plus tribes uh, that are part of the forum. And I can say they're doing some phenomenal work and I'm not here to represent them. I'm not here to talk on behalf of them, but I will share a little bit about what they're doing because I do think it's incredible. Um, and then I guess the other main hat I wear is a co-director of uh, Ngāpai o Te Maramatanga, which is uh, Aotearoa's only Indigenous Centre of Research Excellence. It's a national centre. Uh, we've been around for 21 years. We have 150 plus Māori researchers who uh, work across every discipline and uh, Māori knowledge, Indigenous knowledge is really at the forefront of, of everything that they do. So it's an extraordinary privilege to be working alongside um, these researchers. And uh, so I'm really pleased to be here. I'm uh, looking forward forward to a good conversation and I think I'll, I'll park it there and hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tahu Katu, Katua. Is that better? Katua. Oh, uh, Kukuta. Kukuta. Okay, thank you. Kukuta. And I'll pass it along to Marcel Sindong. Good afternoon, everyone. I happen to have met most of you here this afternoon, so it's nice to see you again. I'm also very happy to be here to participate in an important conversation that we're having about, um, you know, the, the subject matter that we're going to discuss. And uh, so, as I mentioned, my, na my name is Marcel St. Ange. I am a Métis person born in St. Boniface, Manitoba. I hold a Bachelor uh, of Social Work degree from the University of Victoria and later on in my uh, life, I obtained a Juris Doctor from the University of Saskatchewan College of Law. So I've worked for the government of Saskatchewan uh, before coming here to work with MNC for 37 years and uh, predominantly with children and families. Um, I do intend to go into each of those areas that I've worked um, in, in responding to the questions that's going to be asked of me, so I won't go into more detail about that, but I w feel compelled to say I have three boys, I have a granddaughter, and expecting a grandson in a few short weeks, so I'm very excited about that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Marcel saint ange Excuse me for... Um I didn't have a note of your title, but thank you. So we've got a very prestigious panel here, and I love that we're all grounded in the fact that we're parents, we're grandparents, and we're thinking today about the center of our hearts, which is our children and our children's future. So the way it's going to work is we have a few targeted questions for each of the panelists that have been catered based on their expertise, and we'll be following up that series of questions with an open discussion asking all of you in the room to participate, perhaps keeping track of the questions that come up for you during the panelists' responses or comments. Good. <clears throat> so actually, Marcel, you're going to be the first um, up to the bat here. So what we wanted to ask you was, can you tell us a little bit about an act respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and families formerly known as Bill C-92. What importance does it have for the Métis Nation? So that's a great question, and it was very interesting to have former Minister Lametti speak um, earlier uh, this morning, and particularly because he sort of um, spoke about C-92 and those things that were important within the Act, which resulted in it being... Um, you know, uh, passed and supported by the Supreme Court of Canada, which was a great thing to have happen. But I've chosen today to share my thoughts and story about the evolution of the act um, through my personal and professional experience. And my goal is to set the context for the importance of data in the discussion over the next hour. So. If you bear with me, I'm going to go into a little bit of where I've worked and what I 
saw and experienced with regard to, to data. And we'll end with the how important what will be going forward. So um, my first 11 years of experience was working with young offenders um, in Saskatchewan. Um, and most of the um, children and youth that I worked with were Indigenous children. So the greatest number of children in custody in Saskatchewan were Indigenous. And around 75 to 80 percent was what I, um, you know, estimated the number to be. And I estimated because there's very poor data kept at the time about who was coming in. And if, I mean, we kept the numbers, but there was very poor data in terms of whether a child was Indigenous or if they were, whether they were status um, Indian or whether, you know, I don't think a lot of people knew what Métis people were, so often there was sections left blank and wouldn't know what a, a non-status person was. So what would be um, seen as very important data wasn't kept very well. Um, back then. In my next 15 years, I worked for the Children's Advocate Office of Saskatchewan, as, first as an advocate and then as the Director of Investigations, which included uh, child death reviews. And so we advocated for our children and families in most areas where government services were provided. And again, the high numbers of Indigenous children that we were engaged with, children and families, most of the cases were child welfare cases, so then that isn't a, a surprise, knowing most children um, in care, at least in Saskatchewan, are uh, Indigenous children. Um, most child death reviews involved Indigenous children as well, so if we did 34 in a year, probably, um, 30 of those involved in Indigenous children. The same issue with respect to data. Most of the data was um, provided by provincial governments, um, and so uh, not very reliable at all. Again, with respect to um, how information was recorded, and um, so you weren't able to draw out you know, those numbers that you needed to, to do good planning. The next four years, I worked as a director of child and family services in the north region and in the center region of Saskatchewan, so Saskatoon and north over those four years. Um, and what we did at one point, so back then, 67% of the children in, in care were identified as indigenous, and again, not very well broken down by distinction. And so, there was also a list of over a thousand that were identified as other or unknown. So people didn't fill out the, uh, the database very well. So there was all these children who weren't really accounted for in terms of their, uh, their ethnicity. So we did, turn, did a pilot project and we, we went back through all of those files. So there weren't any new uh, admissions or children who came into care. We looked at what was existing. And over a period of about six months, the percentage of children in care went from 67% Indigenous to over 86% Indigenous. And when we published that information, it caused a lot of concern and the, and the media became involved and our minister had to start um, trying to explain what was happening and it was poor data collection and poor management of data. The last eight years, I was the director of First Nations and Métis Services for the Ministry of Social Services, and I was responsible for 19 delegation agreements representing 63 bands, um, all of which were re required to follow provincial child and family service laws um, and were funded by Indigenous Services Canada. A couple of folks in, in the crowd are um, from ISC today. During that time, C-92 was uh, developed and came into law. And I happened to be able to sit at the first coordination agreement table, which resulted in uh, the signing of the coordination agreement, um, which was very um, time consuming and labor intensive. 
but it was a, an a, a awesome experience. And data was significant in that instance because the funding arrangement that needed to um, be included, which was not part of the you know, coordination agreement, but was negotiated after, was based on the number of children and families being served. The um, uh, funding that was provided for prevention was based on the number of people in the community. And so funding, centrally important to providing the services that you want your law to, to um, be able to provide, needed a, uh, accurate data. So the importance of that uh, was ultimately so significant that uh, it, it, I just need to talk about how important data was in that circumstance. I was also a commissioner for the Saskatchewan Legal Aid Commission for three years, and again, large numbers of Indigenous clients. Service was in, in, you know, based on their income and covered criminal and family law, and again, you could see the importance of data to be able to plan and fund that agency. So what I experienced in, in almost each role along the way was mediocre to poor data collection often not recorded or the section left blank, or if so, children and families incorrectly identified as other or unknown. So um, how do you plan? How do you allocate resources in those circumstances? The information's only as good as the person entering the data and the effort made by the organization to be accountable, which, as you're hearing from me, wasn't very well done over my, over my career. What I observed was the recording and management of data squarely outside the scope of what was required and created a divide in what we would call today a sustainable global development objective of helping to uplift vulnerable populations through the use of meaningful, accurate use and management of data for evaluating, assessing, and creating better futures for Métis families. And the experience that I had in my career has spanned the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls for Action. Minister Lametti mentioned those this morning. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, again mentioned this morning, and how the importance of that. The 2017 Human Rights Tribunal decision and subsequent orders as well as this creation of the six points, six point action plan by the federal government to address the crisis in child welfare. All of those came together ultimately to influence the development and passing into law of the act in June of 2019, which came into force in January of 2020. As was mentioned, the law was unanimously found to be constitutional by the Supreme Court only a few weeks ago, and Minister Lametti really did a good job of explaining that and the importance of, you know, UNDRIP and the efforts that went into including those things that were important um, and gave the Supreme Court the ability to do something different. So they didn't, they created somewhat of a new test or reasoning that enabled them to um, unanimously, unanimously uphold that law. So the act provides a pathway to take back jurisdiction and accountability for our children that was taken away many years ago. It aff affirms indigenous communities' jurisdiction in relation to child and family services, establishes national standards applicable across Canada that are in effect today and must be considered when dealing with Indigenous children in any child welfare system. So all the provincial child and family services systems must consider those uh, principles uh, when working with Indigenous children today. Um, implementing aspects of UNDRIP, which I mentioned, and advancing reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. So all of those things built into the act, which was um, very well thought out and planned and worked out in the end of the day. And, and when, we, when 
former minister Lametti was talking about whereas clauses and the importance of those in this particular situation. I think he mentioned 22. My experience with the law was typically, you know, it, those whereas clauses would provide context, context, but they wouldn't carry significant weight. But they seem to have done so in this case. And, you know, considering UNDRIP and the, the, re the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, when he talked about the braiding of those things, that was really where the Supreme Court did something they hadn't done before. Braiding those things together and using them to establish, I, I, I call a different test to, to find that law constitutional. Um, the importance of, the, I know I'm <laughs> running a little long, but the importance of the act is creating the ability to develop and implement our own laws and systems to address child and family well-being based on Métis values, needs, culture, traditions, and spirituality, and data is central to accomplishing that task. We need to know how many of our children are in care, how many families are affected or receiving services by provincial or other child welfare agencies to achieve our vision and desire to provide the best culturally based services to children and families. Fantastic. Thank you for taking us along on this amazing journey that's brought you here now and you come here with such humility uh, given your role. Now I'll be uh, posing a question to Grandmother Gwen. What role has data played historically and currently in perpetuating challenges experienced by First Nation, Métis, and Inuit children, youth, and families involved with CFS systems? Thank you very much for that um, response that was given by the previous panelist. Uh, I enjoyed listening to you. <clears throat> so I think it's really important to understand, number one, what data are, <laughs> because I'm not a data expert, okay? So when I really understood what data are, and I say data are because I just learned not that long ago that data is the plural of datum. So yeah, so I, I have to speak in the right, you know, use the right language. So data to me is, is, is basically, again, just as a human being, it's how I live my life. It's everything I gather through observation as an artist, as a, as a human being. You know, I look out the window to gather units of information, which basically uh, are I'm looking at clouds. I'm looking at trees bending. I'm looking at things that are telling me what the weather is like outside. That's how immediately we, we should be thinking about data. Data is not a scientific thing. Data has been put into a scientific box and used to look at us like we're subjects. Well, that's not what we are. We are uh, 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 not savages, they called us that. We are not Indians, wrong continent. Uh, we're not natives, that was politically correct. We were Aboriginal, constitutionally enshrined. Um, now we got this label of First Nations hanging over us in this era of distinctions-based relationships. Well, I'm not indigenous, that's another colonial label. And again, you know, it's these people in the UN that are talking about us. Oh, our indigenous peoples is the way some colonial governments think about us. And some of those ministers and those other people still use those terms, our indigenous people. Like we belong to Canada instead of the other way around. So if we really understand what data are, uh, how data has been positioned in terms of relationships, because that's what data are as well. It, it, it's looking at relationships of one thing to another thing. And so we are not those colonial labels. We are very unique, distinct peoples. And even the Métis people in this world of indigenous populations, a very unique indigenous population in Canada. And I used to say you were the only real Canadians because you were made up of First Nations blood and newcomer blood. So that was like to be Canadian, the rest of them are either immigrants or they're us, right? It's like, so it's just really understanding, I guess, and embracing the concept of what data are in relation to us as people. And so the grandmother perspective on data was really about stopping the concept of big brother, which we all know colonial governments and these, 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 these even the concept of capitalism is based on these kind of pressures of um, we work for somebody else and perpetuate these things. So when we really start to understand what data are in relation to unique, distinct peoples, data are the things that help us to say who we are uniquely, distinctly. 
as individuals, and then as we self-define within a population. And so data for us in relation to what historical issues we've seen, which are perpetuated today, is number one, the lack of recognition for data ownership. And I know we have OCAP and, and Métis people have OCAS, but basically when you understand what it is, the O is about ownership. I own Gwen Phillips' data, whether it's my health data or wherever, somebody else might have possession of it. They may have it in their, their database, but it's my data. So data ownership has been one of our historical and contemporary challenges that even though we got these pretty symbols and acronyms and all of this lovely philosophy, people really don't understand it until the rubber hits the road, until that data becomes something that we're talking about in real terms, not in the abstract. So understanding what data are in relation to our ability to actually um, assume our functional governance. So ownership and control of data are aspects of governance. And again, we have not had the ability in the past couple hundred years to perform governance. Governance, setting standards for your people, achieving those standards, reminding your people when they're not achieving those standards and helping them to move towards those standards. The worldview of the Tanakha people is unique and distinct. My language is unique and distinct. And language is where your data principles come from. So really understanding, again, you know, when we think about the Michif language, for example, you've got these beautiful roots that go back to, uh, I think, you know, Cree or Chippewa, other populations that bring these philosophies in and twine them with your, the philosophies of the other peoples that make up the Métis population, which becomes this beautiful, beautiful culture. And so understanding what data are, data are our expressions of who we are distinctly and uniquely. And they've been treated like numbers that attach to things like disease and dysfunction, which were created by the pressures of colonization. And the colonial governments, again, are still holding on to these measures of disease and dysfunction to know whether or not we're well. And those don't equate to well-being, especially from the Tanakh worldview. So really understanding where data sits in this, this construct of perpetuating inequity, number one, distinctly recognition of who we are. And I looked at the sustainable development uh, uh, goals years ago when they were first kind of batted out there as the next thing that we were gonna all aspire to. And I went, you know, there's a few things missing in there. And I see, you'll still see a little bit of a paternalistic lay layer of thinking on those things. And so really understanding what these things mean, for example, the Tanakhah don't believe in economic development. We believe in our, our being part of the naturally existing economy. And I say economy because the Tanakhah had concepts of, uh, of, of taxation and wealth distribution. But it was done in a way that we were actually living within what we call aknomochtisis. Aknomochtisis is the natural law. And so understanding within our worldview how we care for our children, how our laws are, what all of those things that's what data are. That's what data are. Data are the things that we hold value to. And if we don't hold value to them, then other people will say what values they're going to cast upon us. So again, proxies for disease and dysfunction. And the scarcity of data. Yes, identity. Identity is core to this. And so when I talk about, again, what data are in relation to our worldview, Data is intellectual property ownership, not just data in the nation to a, a, a number or two. So thinking about data as an expanded concept of everything we know about ourselves, including our language, which encodes so many things. I've been on the Trangawaiwe Marae. I've been in Garwahia. I've actually walked through that river. Uh, I went and fished for eels. And so a very different culture, very different worldview. In fact, in the Southern Hemisphere, I was a little lost. <laughs> because my global worldview where I look up at the stars is very different. And so really understanding, we don't wanna know where our children are once they're in care or fear of them in care. We wanna know all of our people. The Danaka elders say there's not enough Danaka to throw even one away. And so what are data? Data are our people wherever they are. And yes, we have to put numbers to them to anonymize them in this world of protecting people's privacy. But our concept of intellectual property, our concept of privacy is different than mainstream peoples. And so I was recently presenting to the BC Office of the Privacy Commissioner on these things. And how in British Columbia, we have 34 unique idol languages, and then we have Métis language, and then we have all other languages of the indigenous people that live here. But really understanding that it's from where we rest on the ground. 
and knowing Saskatchewan is very different than where I live in the Rocky Mountains, we have different worldviews, different ways of thinking and being. So what has it played historically and continues to do? Not understanding that governance requires data, that data is an asset of any government, that our governments serve our people, that we are distinct nations, a nation's not an entity, it's identity, and that identity is related to data, data reclamation. So when we think about child and family services, the Tanakh don't think about that. We've kind of parked that concept years ago because that's, again, a colonial way of looking at the world. We look at our worldview from the point of understanding how things relate. We don't believe we own the child. We believe the creator owns the child. We're responsible for stewing that child through their environment to the point where they are understanding their environment and able to function with the uh, right behaviors. And so really understanding determinants of well-being, population health, appreciative inquiry, all of these things we understand in the scientific place, including data. When you apply them to a distinct population, distinct, not the label First Nations, but distinctly the 84 unique languages of Canada that are First Nations languages, those are where our worldview is held. And so we have the right to our nationality, UN DRIPA says so, so we have to connect all of these UN DRIP philosophies, but really understanding that the legal framework in Canada is not just, and this work is not just tied to that C92 child welfare legislation. That was what I call recognition legislation. It recognizes the fact that we have the same responsibilities as indigenous governments that the other governments have for our distinct peoples. And so in that and unpacking that, finding the room for our governments to be exercising those responsibilities and having sovereignty over our data. And I'm waiting for this next response around sovereignty because I'm not going to go there. I'm going to let that, 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 that box be opened. But really understanding that what we're talking about here is our rights to be who we are. And Indigenous data sovereignty, I was sneaky in calling it that because people thought that's what I was really doing all these years. It's actually data for sovereignty. And that's where we are now is expressing that we are distinct and unique peoples with a worldview, with a way of dealing with all of these crazinesses that we're, 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 we're dealing with. And I keep reminding people that you don't battle the opioids crisis, which is something we're all dealing with in Canada right now, by dealing and battling the opioids crisis. You battle the opioids crisis by addressing a broader determinants of well-being, by helping people belong and feel well again, by helping them understand who they are and take ownership over themselves. And that's not what our world does, and that's not how data treats us. And so data should be belonging to every individual. It should then expand into their populations and address the, the, the challenges that the people have from their own worldview. So we want to build strong, healthy people again. We don't want to get rid of problems. If you look for problems, you'll always find problems. If you look for strength, people will remember what that is, and they'll want to be that again. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Powerful, poetic. Thank you very much. So the next uh, curated question will be for Tahu. What, uh, continuing in this conversation, to, what to you is Indigenous data sovereignty? And what role does it play in Indigenous self-determination? Great, thank big questions. And I could actually just sit and listen to Grandmother Gwen speak for another half an hour, as I'm sure all of us could. And you know what? I feel a little fraudulent talking about data sovereignty in the presence of someone who's been doing it for so long, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, I love what you were saying, Gwen, about data being, you know, our relations, our past, present, and future, and data, data being our, our uh, identities, not just numbers. Um, and that's certainly the way that we've tried to approach it in Aotearoa. Um, so, you know, if you get, I guess if you're getting into the matter of definition, there's lots of definitions of uh, Indigenous data sovereignty, and they, they all refer in some um, way or some version of the inherent uh, rights and interests that Indigenous peoples have in relation to the collection and ownership and application of Indigenous data. That's sort of the stock standard um, definition. I, I kind of think of it much more simply as putting 
uh, indigenous data in indigenous hands, or if it's uh, putting Māori data in Māori hands, if it's my uh, my clan, my hapu, my sub-tribe, it's putting our Ngāti tipa data in our own hands. Um, government officials love to read that as data access. <laughs> data, data access, I mean, that's, that's the bare minimum. Um, uh, it's actually about having authority, about what meaningful authority and decision making about what happens to our data, and that's data with um, a big D, not a little D. So it's not a circumscribed category of um, data, but it's it's the, it's the big uh, amorphous category that includes our information, our our knowledge uh, in digital and digitizable format, uh, very much in the in the way that Gwen was talking about it. And if our data are really what we call an Aotearoa, a tauma, uh, something precious of tangible and intangible value, uh, then we better make sure uh, that we're the best guardians of it. So it's not just about rights, it's also about responsibilities um, and the collective responsibilities that, that we have uh, to be the best kaitiaki uh, or stewards or guardians of our own um, uh, precious taonga. So... Uh, what role does Indigenous data sovereignty play in Indigenous self-determination? Man, that's a huge question. I, I will say, because we've just been talking about the UN and other agencies and so forth, is that uh, in 2015, I went to this gathering in New York um, held by the uh, UNDESA, which is the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, around the SDGs and Indigenous data. And our paper was around uh, Indigenous data sovereignty and the, and the SDGs. And i got to say... Um, even the language of so sovereignty um, and the messages uh, that we were conveying, uh, which went far beyond data disaggregation, you know, so data dis disaggregation is just the beginning point. Data sovereignty is much more than that. And I, and I got to say, it, th those messages really fell on deaf ears. And um, the powers that be in, in those organisations I really didn't want to relinquish control around Indigenous data, and they had a very limited concept and uh, in view of of what Indigenous data could and should be, and um, so that was really revealing. I don't know if it shifted at all. I, I suspect maybe not, um, but anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd share that observation. So this this larger question, um, there's so many ways to uh, approach this. I did write a paper. A few years ago with a, a colleague of mine, Māori colleague of mine, Donna Cormack, where we explored the linkages between Indigenous data sovereignty, self-determination and policy, focusing on our own context because that's what we know best. Um, and, our, and our central argument was something like this, really that uh, the fullness of Indigenous data sovereignty just cannot be realised within the architecture of the colonial settler state. Um, we can aim for a really strong form of data governance um, within... Uh, uh, colonial government uh, organisations and architecture, if you like. But what we really need is a redistribution of resources um, away from settler state initiatives that don't work. Um, and we have so many examples of that, uh, from including um, the care and protection of, of Indigenous children. Um, so we need a redistribution of that resource away from initiatives that don't work to Māori and tribal nations and communities to develop and control our own data systems. Um, and have our own data there using our own protocols. And so that, you know, data sovereignty is not something that really can be realised within, within uh, colonial government organisations, but they can aim for a really good version of data governance. So uh, I guess all Indigenous data sovereignty networks, uh, whether it's Australia or Aotearoa or, or around the Pacific uh, or the US or Canada, um, are explicitly linked to self-determination, and that's probably not surprising because uh, as Indigenous peoples, whatever we call ourselves, we will generally agree that self-determination and sovereignty is our inherent right and our desired outcome. Um, and although self-determination is sort of central to this global human rights and Indigenous rights discourses, which Gwen has also critiqued, there are, of course, domestic nuances that we must speak to. Um, we have our own distinct and unique worldviews, and it really doesn't make sense if we try to impose something from the outside to the inside. It just doesn't work. It falls over really quickly. So in the context of Aotearoa, um, there's a, a Māori lawyer, Valma Toki, and she argues that uh, what we call tino ranga tiratanga, it's a Māori concept that can be defined as absolute chiefly authority, 
this offers a stronger right for us than the Western paradigm of self-determination um, because the latter derives and exists under sovereignty as an international law norm, uh, whereas Tinoranga Tiratanga exists independently of state sovereignty. That is, it exists whether the state recognises it or not. So uh, Tinoranga Tiratanga is closely aligned, aligned with another intrinsically Māori concept, which is mana mutuhake. And one of our foremost Māori legal scholars and constitutional minds, the late uh, Dr Moana Jackson, he argued that while sovereignty is not a Māori concept of power, mana is, and it's the very Māori expression uh, of the very human desire to be free and to make uh, one's own decision in one's land. So uh, inherent in that notion of mana motuhake is the concept of mana whenua, which is literally to hold territorial rights associated with uh, long-term occupation. So I think this is a long-winded way of saying exactly what Gwen also said, <laughs> is that data sovereignty cannot be decoupled from big sovereignty, and we have our own unique and distinct ways of understanding and expressing and articulating this. Um, so te mana, following on that, that terminology of mana, te mana rarunga, that's the name of the Māori Data Sovereignty Network. So I'm really using our own language to animate uh, our own aspirations in this data and digital realm. Uh, the Māori Data Sovereignty Principles, which followed very quickly uh, from the establishment of the network, um, these six principles, uh, they're in our own language, um, and I guess in a way that's doable for us because we only have one language and that one language can be mutually comprehended across all the tribes. So that enables us uh, easily, I think, to express our data aspirations in our own native language. Um, and those principles express a reciprocal relationship between Māori data sovereignty and what we might call tinoranga tiratanga or mana motuhake. And that is that Māori data sovereignty is an, both an expression of our uh, authority or sovereignty, but it's also a key enabler of our collective autonomy in a much broader sense. So it, so it does two things, and it, there's a reciprocal relationship um, between them both. Um, I think sometimes if we talk in the abstract for too long, uh, we lose the plot. I do. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, there's so many, but I'll just limit it to two. And I, sorry, I haven't kept track of time. Do I have it like another five minutes? <laughs> give you two examples um, of what we're doing. So sorry, but unfortunately you have another one minute. Maybe you could give us oh, one, one minute. Example. Okay, well, yeah. maybe I'll, oh yeah, no problem. Look, I, I gave too much of a preamble. Well, um, so the two examples that I was going to talk about, one is the Māori data governance model uh, that has been published by Te Kahui Rāraunga, which is an independent trust set up to drive the advocacy for the Tribal Leaders Forum data group. So if you Googled Māori data governance model, the model would come up. It was basically created through a treaty-based relationship agreement uh, with Stats New Zealand, which is a government agency, and the purpose of the model is basically to put in place Māori data governance over Māori data that's held by all the government agencies. Uh, why is that important? Because they hold most of our data. Um, and that ought not be a surprise because data was part of the colonial project um, for surveillance and all the things that others have talked about. So that governance model is really trying to hold the, the nation state government to account for what it does with our data and to give very clear instructions on the actions that they need to take and the sorts of things that they need to prioritise because given high level principles, they will just do with it what they want to do and the same things will happen. So that Māori data governance model is online, uh, you can look at it and we were very lucky to sit with FNIGC and the First Nations data governance strategy team and they shared uh, their learnings and their wisdom with us, and we're just really grateful that they um, gave us the time to do that. And then I guess the second example also comes from Te Kahui Rāraunga, and they have their own website, um, and that is called Te Mana Whaka Tipu. Now, this is where the data sovereignty really happens, and it's all focused on building tribal and community data capacities, capabilities, and infrastructure, and there's a whole suite of really exciting, amazing initiatives that they've undertaken in the last five years. One of them is called Tefata, T-E-W-H-A-T-A. -T -T you can see it online. It's a tribal data um, 
infrastructure that repurposes and recalibrates tribal data in ways that make sense to tribes and enables them to add their own um, priorities and their own narratives in ways that they can use much more usefully than when the central government has it. And the last one that I'll just mention is um, something called Te Mana Whaka Tipu, which is really um, building uh, data capacities uh, in communities, and that's been hugely successful. Our 2018 and 2023 census from Stats New Zealand went completely pear-shaped. In 2018, they missed 30% of the Māori population. How can you miss 30% of the population literally the purpose of the census is to count everyone. Um, and so that left big holes in um, Māori data. And uh, so what Te Mana Whakatipu did was, in two areas, send out community enumerators. And to cut a long story short, they just did a much better job, surprise, surprise, than the central government agency could. And that's provided a foundation for a conversation around the future of the census and does our data really belong with a government agency? So apologies as I've gone over time and I'll, I'll draw a line under it there and hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And please, you don't need to apologize. We actually got started a little bit late, as you all know. So we are going to run the session a little late and take into your break time because we do have this amazing opportunity to learn from these experts. So now I'll pass a question to Alison and... What we'll ask you is, how have colonial child welfare systems shaped the current health and well-being of Métis children, youth, and families, and communities? Thank you um, for that um, really important question. And all the presenters have really provided such important insights into the significance of data um, for Indigenous peoples. And so along the lines of the um, you know, the importance of data. As a historian, um, I, uh, I look at data and, and in terms of our, um, you know, discipline, we, we call it sources and it's, um, but realistically, um, when doing research on the 60s scoop, um, you know, looking at government documents and the way in which um, governments were crafting policies that were designed um, for Indigenous peoples in Saskatchewan, specifically First Nations and Métis in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, um, it provided um, those documents, um, annual reports, and um, departmental communications provided a lot of insight. Um, and perhaps un unlike, um, you know, in more recent years, there was a lot of data collected on the ethnicity of the children that were apprehended. Um, the rationales for their apprehension, um, as well as their, um, you know, you know where uh, I guess their, you know, eventually whether they entered, left the system or remained in the system. Um, so, in terms of um, historical data on the indigenous experience of the child welfare in Saskatchewan, which I'm more familiar with, um, I think there is a lot that we can. Um, can find out about the experiences of our, our grandmothers and our parents. Uh, and so in terms of the, um, the, the impact of these colonial child welfare systems, uh, on one hand, um, in, in sort of keeping the, the sort of the, the theme of data, there is a rich body of information about our relatives that are being held in these um, by these government systems. Um, so in terms of the, there's the sort of um, numerical data and the, the, you know, and how that was utilized for um, planning and the development of programs such as the Adopt Indian and Métis program. Um, there's, uh, that, there's that significant kind of um, element to it and in in how the numbers of Indigenous um, children uh, increased over the course of the 60s and 70s um, and has sort of remained constant uh, through the 80s, 90s and into today um, as overrepresented in the systems. Um, and on the other hand, there's, as Gwen was talking about, that, that um, 
that broader kind of data about the day-to-day -day lived experience of being an Indigenous child who is a ward of the state. Um, and so due to um, the privacy legislation, um, you know, it can be difficult to access sometimes our own files or sometimes um, the files of our parents or our grandparents to fill in the important um, pieces of our lives that um, are being held by, by different governments as Indigenous children who were um, removed from their families and cared for or um, incarcerated might be a better term in some cases by institutions, by foster parents, or by um, in some cases adopted. Some of these, um, these files held by the system um, contain information and um, valuable insights into lost family history. So in terms of being a Métis person, that kinship is so critical to understanding our identities and who we are, where we belong, um, our communities of origin. And so, um, you know, thinking about in terms of how important that is for um, children into the future um, as they're, you know, as they, you know, interact with new systems, I guess you might say, uh, as they unfold, um, that keeping being mindful that those files and those um, what's generated through these interactions contain critical pieces of our history and lived experiences. Um, and so that um, really relates to well-being, um, you know, for children and now adults who have been impacted through the through the 60 scoop and um, the child welfare systems in that not knowing not understanding where people come from not understanding um, you know child removal as a systemic and colonial kind of intervention into families um, can prevent you know indigenous metis children specifically and adults from knowing their identity um, knowing where the community is knowing who their family is as many of especially adoptees um, were given new names um, in their adoptive families and so that's I, I think a critical part of the um, perhaps not necessarily addressed by the, the new legislation, but um, for adults today, uh, knowing who their kinship connections are, it, it's important for uh, lots of different reasons, but as Métis people from Saskatchewan, knowing who our kin are has um, fundamental, it's fundamentally important as we, um, you know, it's a small province, it's a small community. Um, we need to know who our relatives are. And that was one important role of the grandmothers who would keep that knowledge and keep those laws um, as part of um, our Indigenous knowledge systems. And so severing, um, severing that knowledge from the community and having it reside outside uh, in terms of the, you know, within the sort of government systems and withheld um, through privacy legislation from communities, from um, our knowledge keepers um, is a, a, a really, um, you know, it really perpetuates this um, uh, colonial relationship, I believe, um, um, today. And, and I know that there are many people that are reconnecting or hoping to reconnect with their family and understand, you know, what, what happened to their parents and grandparents as part of these systems and um, facilitating that and making, making that possible for, for people today and their children moving forward is is really critical. So um, that's sort of, sort of my insight um, in terms of the impact is that these um, colonial child welfare systems were in, were sort of um, created, um, you know, as not, you know, we were sort of in, inserted into them uh, when it became evident that they could serve a very, um, you know, they could serve the the state in in um, rehabilitating not only our, our children, but our families as well, or perhaps uh, disciplining them would be a better, a better term. Um, but nevertheless, um, the, the legacies of those systems continue and thinking critically about how, uh, what information is contained, how it's, how it's withheld and um, whether or not um, identifying needy children, say in the 1960s and 70s, in order to um, create um, programs and policies to um, adopt us out or hiding our identities is all part of a larger strategy of um, that really highlights how um, data um, is never neutral 
Um, certainly, and what is collected and what is not collected often is reflected in the the, the power relationships between uh, who has a say in um, in what's collected or how it's interpreted as well, which is really, I think, at the heart of um, Indigenous data governance movements and data sovereignty movements. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Alison. Wow. Wow. Um... And thank you all here and to the panel for being so adaptive today um, and really being present. We will not have time to do a formal q and A in during this session. However, we have been introduced to some research papers, some books. We'll have an opportunity to learn more from these experts. Um, and certainly, Marcel will be here in the room. You can catch him in the break to perhaps ask him your question at that point. We also got a message from Gwen apologizing for having to leave early, but thanking you all for coming here. And I'll just echo that again. Thank you all so much for being present and listening and, and being a part of this important change and topic. Thank you. Thank you.